uh, but certainly we can take a few contributions from the floor. So maybe if we could, if, if I could group them, maybe three contributions and uh, get and get responses. Gentleman there, who's next? Gentleman in the front here, someone at the back, and the lady in the lady there. I'll take take these three first, and if we can, everyone can keep it brief. We'll maybe get another round in. Thanks. Where's the microphones? Uh, Could you just say who, just identify yourself? Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to switch it off. It's on, is it? Sorry, yes. Um, my name's Nick Gotts. My main interest in coming here is um, climate change. Uh, we had some interesting talks, uh, but looking at Mr. Macron's uh, projections, um, basically they're, they're totally inadequate they're not going to get us anywhere near avoiding catastrophic climate change. Best science says we need to leave two-thirds of known fossil fuel reserves in the ground. And yet, we know that industry is still searching for new fossil fuels. Um, we know that we need to change consumer behaviour. And yet, it's not in the interests of energy to supply suppliers for consumers to use less. Basically, we're, we're fighting against the entire logic of capitalism and what is going on here, it's not exactly fiddling while Rome burns, but it's, you know, pouring a, a, using a bucket chain while Rome burns. I'd just like some comments from that on, uh, from the panel. Thanks very much. We'll just, we'll, we'll group three together. There was the, yeah, gentleman at the front here, please. Thank you. James Whitworth. Um, I'm retired and have been for some time and I live in Shetland and I want to bring up one or two points. Of one. One. All right. Lawrence Slade talked about the problems of people who are off the gas grid and Shetland is entirely off the gas grid or will be, though we're building a huge gas terminal there, but nothing will go to Shetland from it. They won't even have brought it on to the end of it a small facility whereby gas containers could be refilled in Shetland instead of being sent down to Grangemouth and brought up, wasting large amounts of fuel in transport. Why is no one thinking about these little things that could actually help? Good, good, good succinct question. Uh, and the uh, lady five or six rows behind. Hi, Claire Chapman, Scottish Water. I had a comment for Chris Stark, uh, your last speaker. It was your last slide, I think, um, on renewable outputs from Scotland. I noticed that sewage gas had a very tiny slice in 2012, I think it was. But I'm convinced that it is such a small slice of the renewable output in Scotland because of the very small rock uh, reward for it. I think it's only half a rock. And yet sewage gas is prevalent in every city. Um, you know, I just wondered in terms of your thoughts on, on, on the rocks for sewage gas and on why you know, it couldn't be better supported. It, it's something that, that you know, is everywhere and, and I just feel it's a missed opportunity. Okay, thanks. There are quite specific questions. Uh, Lawrence, um, climate change, not in the gener generator's interest to, for us to use less. Is there not a kind of inherent paradox there? And also maybe you could address the specific question on, uh, on, on Shetland gas. I think it's, it's, it is an interesting one in, in terms of not in the interest of energy companies. I would argue, actually, it is if government policy has got right. Um, I think however you cut things up, there is still a role for energy companies. And I think the critical aspect is if is the government policy there, and as Chris said, is the regulatory framework there to actually support a generation future that leads to the decarbonisation of our generation assets. The critical thing is making sure that the investment community actually has the confidence to come into the UK and actually support the companies in how they're approaching their generation capacity and actually provides a framework and provides the certainty that's needed for that investment so that companies can plan 
how we can actually deliver the decarbonisation and how we can actually structure our generation assets so that you can have your base load support, but you can also then start investing in uh, local smart grid issues as well. So I think there's still a role there, but the critical thing is making sure that uh, the investment certainty and the policy frameworks are in place. I think in terms of uh, looking at things like Shetland area, um, had a couple of interesting conversations about that yesterday, so it's undoubtedly a, a, a hot topic. It's somewhat off my um, expertise area, but I think it, I f hate to say it, but it, it comes back to policy and it comes back to how you can support local communities who are off the grid, because often communities in that situation um, are facing higher energy costs and it does need to be addressed. And it's a situation that can be found right the way across the UK, not just in, uh, in the Highlands and Islands. So it, it is a, an issue that we do have to look at. Let's just go one. Get, maybe you could raise for your members a specific question, just so of, of the, the Shetland issue. Maybe maybe yeah. speak to SSE about it or, or somebody and see see well, whether whether or to, or to, okay. Well, just so it, so it's not just a comment that floats yeah. away. Just yeah. have a specific assurance that that will be followed up. Chris Ro Sewage Rocks. Sewage Rocks. There's something to talk about. Um, the um, uh, uh, well, let me say first of all, um, I. The, ch the choice of how valuable a rock is is clearly a decision for ministers, and we've given advice about various things. Um, uh, I don't disagree with the fact, I mean, I was just looking at the chart, it's a very small sliver, isn't it? I don't disagree that a, a higher rock might, might solve the problem, but there are probably other ways in which we might see the development of sewage gas um, uh, become a slightly lar larger sliver in there. And rocks might be part of that, or, or indeed contracts for difference under the, under the new energy market reforms, uh, electricity market reforms. So. Um, maybe we could take it offline. I'd be happy to talk to you about ways in which we might combine a few other policies potentially to try and see some of those things things happen. I think there's probably a kind of recipe here that, that might help. Okay. That's a, a good offer. Seize it. You want to it's public lots of witnesses. It's good. <laughs> uh, fine. Look, let's have one more one more question addressed to our other two speakers. Gentlemen here. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Roy Williamson, UKTI Venture Capital Unit. Um, it's, it's to bring together uh, what you were talking about with energy storage. Um, one thing that's never shown on these charts is energy storage, but I wonder to what contribution that could make, uh, considering you've got 12 hours peak demand, 12 hours very low demand. Uh, in theory, you could double capacity by putting energy storage on the grid. Uh, so I just wondered what the views are about uh, a greater prominence of energy storage within these charts. Okay. That's, that's a, a director, director that Bert who spoke about a energy storage earlier, so maybe Bert and then Angus could just give some final remarks. I fully agree with that, um, that comment. Energy storage, again, is what I said in, in my talk, is, is one of the challenges mankind never came with terms about. I mean, we never find a good solution to do that. Uh, we have the hydro uh, pumping, we have compressed air, we have batteries. But other than that, <clears throat> it's all rather uh, very limited. Uh, from a European perspective, we are currently discussing about the next multi-annual financial framework. And as part of that, also the research, uh, development and innovation budget will be part of that. And from that, there will be a, quite an important aspect on energy storage there. So of course, from, from the hydrogen fuel cells, that will be dealt with, of course, but also some other aspects to see how we can improve how we can to say, um, elaborate further on energy storage, because again, as what you, what you indicated, the intermittency of all the renewable energies is causing basically a problem, because it's not because you have a capacity of a wind farm so much, the actual reliability is much less, because you're never sure how much you can get out of it. So it's clearly a big issue, and, uh, and again, I think for the next, I would say the short distant future, the next five years, we're going to strongly work on it. Um, yes, if I could just uh, draw that question uh, together with the one I think that Nick, I think it was, asked a, a moment ago. Um, I mean, starting with Nick's one, the, the climate change um, uh, picture looking ahead does look very worrying, and, and you're right to say um, totally inadequate. Um, even the charts I showed of the IEA and Exxon depend, even for that level of increase, on considerable amount of energy efficiency and reduction in energy intensity. And if we don't get that, it'll be even worse. So. Uh, it is very worrying. Um, having said that, there are one or two sort of encouraging straws in the wind. If you look at the emissions 
the recent emissions um, picture from places like the US and Australia, then emissions have actually been falling remarkably uh, quickly there, and people haven't really been expecting it. I, think, I haven't got the figure here, but I think for the US, emissions are down something like 8% from their peak about a decade ago. And Australia, there's been a significant fall in the last two or three years. Again, surprising given the, the lack of um, adherence to Kyoto and the rest of it. So some interesting things happening in developed countries, but you've got this ongoing problem of developing, uh, developing countries burning a lot of coal and um, that outweighing whatever's happening on the developed side. Um, but I think on the storage, storage is very interesting because I think if there is one sort of black swan that could come in technologically and really change the picture and make it a lot easier to shift to renewable energy even more quickly than on our forecasts, then it would be um, major developments in storage technology. And a lot of the VCs and, and the big companies are plowing R&D money into um, developing storage and making it cheaper at the moment. So I think it is a very exciting area. And it could be the thing that gets us out of jail on the emission side eventually. OK. A very positive note to end on. Just thank the, the four speakers. I think it against the odds that they have managed to pull this together into some coherent themes. Uh, a very, very interesting hour, and uh, thank you, the, the audience, for, for giving them a good hearing, and I would ask you to show your appreciation for the speakers. Thank you.